All right. Hello, everyone. A uh, very exciting day for our club today. Uh, we're going to be hosting a webinar uh, with two very distinguished guests. Uh, before we get to that point, I uh, just wanted to say on behalf of our entire club and community, um, definitely wishing everyone health and safety amongst your family and loved ones. Uh, I know these are difficult times, especially over the past few weeks, but I do feel we've seen a lot of resiliency and uh, a lot of inspirations um, around us, uh, which has been awesome. So the uh, focus today on the webinar uh, is just to add another great learning opportunity and a great watch for players, parents, and coaches across the entire uh, youth sports environment. Uh, my name is Mola Jazi. I'm the director of operation for the Dearborn Jaguars. Uh, I operate the Dearborn branch. Uh, we're one of five branches for the Michigan Jaguars. And I'm also director of coaching for the Dearborn Soccer Club, our local recreational grassroots uh, club. Uh, at this time, I want to introduce uh, Trevor King, uh, who will speak a little bit about himself and introduce our two guests today. Yeah, hi, thanks, Mo. Thanks, uh, John and Mitch, for being on. So my name is uh, Trevor King. I'm the director of operations for Dearborn Soccer Club, and I'm the technical advisor for the girls program here at Dearborn JAG. So uh, John and Mitch, uh, thanks for doing this. And um, I know there's a lot about your guys' resume, and, and we can speak on that for a while, whether I know Mitch, a uh, former player, obviously FC Cincinnati and Atlanta United, and then now coaching, congratulations, by the way, with um, KC Sporting on the goalkeeper side, and then John Beck, um, obviously Division One college player, Arkansas State, and then now with Pierce Sweat Basketball. But um, the reason I thought of you guys had nothing to do with the amazing things that you've accomplished as players or as coaches. Um, but more to the fact of what do people, what do kids, what do coaches, what do parents need right now? And not just right now, but always. And I think the biggest thing that's come up a million times to me is, is leadership. And what does a leader look like? And what do leaders look like when things aren't going well? And I know Mitch personally, um, there's a lot of guys that can say they've played pro soccer, a lot of girls who can say they've played pro soccer, um, but there's not as many that can say they've done what, what you've done, which is to continue to inspire youth, um, come back to the community, coach kids, work with programs, continue to work with the grassroots. And anytime I've called on you, um, I know you've stepped up and, and the kids and have appreciated it. And you've inspired a lot of people. And because you're a leader, um, no better person than you. And then John, I've been following you for a while. We share all the things that you share online at um, Michigan Soccer Central. And consistently, it's leadership, motivation, saying the right things, doing the right things, and then uh, not just saying it, but you guys follow it with your actions. So um, to me, that's the most important reason you guys are here, and uh, we appreciate your perspective that you're going to offer to us. Awesome. So the, uh, the idea behind today's webinar is, uh, is building tomorrow's champions today. And uh, I couldn't help but look at the headline and focus on one particular world, word in that statement, which is building. Um, I feel that that is a very powerful word, especially when you look at uh, the five pillars that we're going to discuss today, which is leadership, coachability, motivation, working together, and character. Um, you can't have uh, building without having pillars. And so that's going to be the focus of today's conversation. Um, but first off, we'd like to pass the, the floor over to, to John. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, John. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from, from Arkansas. That's uh, awesome, man. And uh, appreciate you joining us today. I appreciate you having me, especially a, a basketball guy here. But I um, <laughs> grew up in a, in a small town of Missouri and, and played everything growing up. Played, played soccer, played baseball, football, swam competitively, and um, was fortunate enough to – kind of start to – I played everything up until about the 10th grade, and then I started to specialize uh, in basketball once I started getting some scholarship opportunities and offers and um, just kind of fell in love with the game at a young age and and uh, played four years, got to coach it in college a little bit, and I've been uh, coaching in high school, junior high, AAU, and then I full-time, you know, just train basketball players now. So, um, you know, sports is very short-lived, and I always – get to kind of share that with my players now is, you know, sports are going to be able to set you up for the rest of your life. And so been very fortunate to be able to still work with players and be around the game I love. So thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Awesome. I follow you on Twitter and uh, I'm a huge fan and uh, always nice to see some of the information that you, you put out there. So appreciate, appreciate that. 
And um, a lot of our, our players, especially from Dearborn, can be familiar with our next guest, which is uh, someone who came out in the summer, did a great job with our kids, uh, working with them, and um, just a great overall person. And boy, uh, Mitch, uh, a lot has changed since the summer until now in, in your life, in our lives. But uh, congratulations on the, on the move over to Kansas City. But uh, give you an opportunity to tell a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, obviously, uh, from the area, um, grew up. Uh, I know I played for the Jays for a little bit, but then went to the Wolves. Um, so, you know, but I, I'm glad to still keep in touch with everybody. And um, like I said, you know, you guys saw me in the summer uh, when I was, you know, trying to get away from soccer and be a real estate agent. And that didn't really work out too well. So, um, no, but I mean, like uh, John said, you know, sports is is a thing that we all hold deep in our heart, and I just couldn't get away from soccer. So, opportunity came um, to to go back into soccer and back into the pro the pro game, um, which is something that I really wanted to do. And um, yeah, so I'm in Kansas City with sporting, uh, you know, with our second team doing the goalkeepers and. Um, it's uh, it's been a it's been a journey and uh, trying to get to the other side of the ball um you know from a player to a coach is is a tough transition um mentally i think uh but i think this time is is giving me uh a good chance to really wrap my head around being a coach um and thinking of the game differently than than being a player so um I had to jump right into to training, but then uh, with this going on, it's uh, it's been a you know kind of a transition phase, which has allowed me to really study up on the game and um, yeah. So that's kind of what we've been doing right now. Awesome, awesome. And what I love about having both of you on today is the fact that we have not only two coaches, but you know two uh, coaches that also lived just in the very shoes that a lot of our players that are listening you know, um, experience. So, you know, being an athlete, being a player, playing at the multiple levels and playing into the college and beyond. Um, I know that, um, you know, people are always fascinated with the storyline and it obviously it's never always just the one slope and there's always a lot of zigs and zags. And, and so that's what excited me today about talking to both of you. Uh, I have a passion for basketball as I do in soccer. And then, you know, seeing Mitch, you know, kind of navigate the, the, wor the world and, and all of your accolades and stuff. So I'm excited to hear more about uh, both of your stories. Uh, so with that being said, uh, today the, the plan is, I want this to be engaging, um, you know, be able to, to, to share our experiences. I uh, don't want to just shoot fire, fire shoot uh, questions at you guys, uh, but, you know, just have an open conversation about, again, your stories. And one of the things that Trevor and I talked about was in sharing your story, uh, we had a few questions, and I couldn't help by, but look at the questions and see some very, um, you know, key words in there. And some of them were experience, um, lessons that you may have learned uh, or experienced. And then, obviously, you know, what roles uh, coaches and clubs may have played throughout that experience. So, uh, Mitch, if you want to start first, just kind of touch on that. be awesome. Yeah, um, you know, obviously my story is a long one. Uh, like you said, a bunch of zigs and zags that never really, um, you know, there's very few people in professional athletics uh, that was kind of handed things. Um, and I think the the people that were, I guess, so-called handed things are, are the ones that were kind of touched by God. Um, you know, Zions and, and LeBrons, um, those guys, and uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi, those guys in, in soccer. But um, so, but I, I don't think I would have changed my journey, um, for, for anything because, um, my whole life, I, I always said that I was going to be a professional soccer player, um, you know, to the point where even my mom was like, okay, but you're going to get a college education too, right? Um, so I did, I did do that, but, um, uh, my whole life I, I was, I was pinpoint on being a professional soccer player this was going to be my living this was going to be what I did when I grew up you know I never wanted to be a, a fireman or an astronaut um I wanted to be a professional soccer player and um that took me into the road of, of never taking no for an answer um somebody said I couldn't do anything I'm going to prove that I can do it um you know and when I wasn't drafted out of college uh because they said I was too small for a goalkeeper um I said, 
you know, but I can jump high and, and I'm quick and I can save a shot. So, um, you know, packed up my car and went on tryouts and um, it just kind of became a thing for me of, of never taking no for an answer and um, bounced around the lower divisions of soccer, which I'm sure a lot of people can guess how much you get paid doing that. Um, so that was, that was tough, but, uh, you know, I finally, um, got to the point where, you know, I was making a good living and I was in Cincinnati and I was doing really well. And then, uh, the opportunity came to go to Atlanta United, which everybody knows is, is probably the, the benchmark of, uh, us soccer right now. Um, and I jumped at the opportunity, um, to be part of that club. Um, even though, you know, the people, uh, I know the team, obviously Brad uh, Guzan is the starting goalkeeper there who's national team, played in England. Um, so a lot of people ask me, why would I go um, from playing every minute in Cincinnati um, and doing really well there to, to go into Atlanta where I'm being brought in to, you know, be a backup, uh, if not a, a third string guy. Um, and my answer is always the same thing is that, I want to achieve things and I don't want to just settle. Um, and, you know, at the time, uh, Cincinnati was in the USL um, and we were winning, we were doing well and they were going to be an MLS team, but they weren't an MLS team yet. And my goal was to be an MLS soccer player. And you never know in athletics, you never know how long it's going to last. Um, so I, I jumped at the opportunity, went to, to Atlanta and then uh, we won the MLS cup that year. So. Um, I played at every level of U.S. soccer, uh, all the way from, you know, like I said, the Jags to the Wolves to college to the PDL, um, and then all three levels of, of professional soccer. And um, I finally got to, you know, what, 29 years later, got to, to an MLS championship, which is the only um, championship I've ever won as a soccer player. So it was uh, – it was pretty, pretty special. Um, and I think the, the journey, um, I would never take it back because it, it, you know, like John said in his intro, it, it teaches you things for, for the rest of your life. You know, no one's going to be a professional soccer player or a professional athlete their entire life. Um, unless you're a golfer, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, it teaches you things that, um, you can hold on for the rest of your life. Like if I have something that I'm going to do, I'm going to do it. You're, you're not going to stop me. Um, you know, and it's, it's not going to happen. If, if there's something that I want to accomplish, I'm going to accomplish it. And I learned that from um, trying to make it in soccer and the things that I hold on dearest. And that's the reason that I, you know, like Trevor, you said, you know, I, I like to talk with kids. I like to, because I had people in my, journey and I it goes back to the slide beforehand when you said whether well, clubs or coaches help it well I don't think I would have gotten to where I would have been without you know clubs and, and coaches um obviously the people in your club know who Paul Tinian is um so you know he helped me greatly um you know to get to certain places not only with you know field time at total soccer you know when the fields were closed he, he allowed me to go in there and or come back and train even though I was in college or just being a friend being you know and that was all the way through um you know so the people that you encounter uh when you're coming up and trying to do something and that's the reason that I don't like kids now so I think I think some kids that are really good at things right now think that things will just be handed to them and it's not the case um, and you're going to piss off a lot of people along the way that aren't willing to help you out um, later on when, when you do need those people. And um, so I think that that's a big message message in my story that um, people recognize uh, hard work. And when you put in hard work at one stage, when you need somebody to kind of help you out, there's going to be people there to, um, I guess lift you up, and, and if you're if you're on a a downward trend, uh, there's people to help you back up. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of my story, and and how I, you know, wouldn't take anything back. You know, the 
sleeping on couches and the selling my selling my car for for rent money and um you know That's because and we want the players to hear these stories you know we want them to know like what was the story of mitch what was the story of john like how did you get to to this point in your career so you know i think that's important to hear those, yeah those yeah it's yeah i could go i could go i mean i'd go on up for a long time but um it was it was mainly just uh, everything that came my way it was go you know use that to propel me to the next thing to propel me to the next thing to ultimately get me to my um my end goal and uh you know no no one thing or you know money money is important but it's not gonna buy you happiness it's not gonna buy you and that's um you know i lost that uh, when i was doing well in the sport a lot of people don't you know the don't hear this part but when i was doing really well um you work so hard to get to that that aspect that you don't want it to end and um i lost a lot of myself and I drove away family members. I drove away friends and I, I really isolated myself. Um, I, I always got really unhealthy um, because I let the stress get to me, um, you know, and, and I could go on a, a lot about that, but um, it was mainly, I lost the enjoyment and um, yeah. So the, I guess I'm going off on a tangent. So I, I, like, I, like this, I think, I think John's going to be able to like, you know, maybe add on some of these different points, you know, when you talk about, um, you know, you have standards for yourself, you use, you know, the phrase never settling, um, mm. you know, people acknowledging your hard work also took you places. And then you talked about enjoyment. And the other piece to that, that I think we can touch on today is going to be, you've probably seen all types of leadership front and center, and, and, you know, staring you in the face at any level, right? Different styles of leadership, good leadership, not so good leadership, things like yeah. that. So. Uh, so John, um, basically the same type of question, you know, I know, uh, uh, Mitch, there's a great, great things in there. So what are some yeah, of your I'm a big note taker. So I was taking notes when he was, <laughs> he was there. just as far as my experience goes, we both, you know, obviously we're all, you know, athletes at heart and we grew up playing, you know, all different types of sports. And, um, even though we both, you know, we play team sports and basketball and soccer, but there's also an individual side. We, we grew up playing individual sports, but we end up kind of gravitating towards a team sport. But like he just said, Mitch said, it's, it's such a, no one's going to tell me what I can't do. And it so becomes a individual sport in the sense of I got to put a lot of work in. And that's usually an isolation type thing. You know, you're, you're constantly trying to get better regardless of what your teammates are doing. You may not have teammates that match your work ethic. And so, you know, you're trying to put in that work and, and become, you know, you have goals and the vision, dreams of what you want to become. And so it becomes individualistic in a team setting, you know, and, and sometimes it's it's individualistic, especially when it comes to the, the speed, the agility, the quickness, the weight training and the things that you do beyond what the team does is what makes you a special player. And so uh, like Mitch said, I was that same guy. I mean, I was the kid that I got up every morning at 5.30 a.m. and I rode my little motorized scooter to school two miles away and I jumped plyometric boxes. I got in the weight room. I, I shot jump shots before school and, you know, it allowed a six foot, you know, white kid from a small school to be a division one player. And so that was kind of my dream is to try to play at the highest level. Um, I wanted to play for the St. Louis Cardinals, you know, when I was younger and then it, it came, I want to be an NBA player. And so um, I, I was fortunate enough to, again, put in a lot of work and, not listen to a lot of the naysayers. Oh, you're, you're too small. You know, you, you're not going to be able to do that. Your division one's out of your reach. And so again, like Mitch said, just putting a lot of work and Hey, you know, this is my dream. I can make it, I can make it reality. And I was fortunate enough. I had like 16 division one offers. And so not only did I get to reach my dream, but I got to go and pick where I was going to ultimately get my education. And so um, after I played four years, I was had a few overseas opportunities. Uh, at that time, it was still, you know, a little bit after 9-11, it was a dangerous time to leave. And I had to make a decision, uh, do I want to keep doing this as a future or do I want to be able to go into coaching and help players? I've always studied the game and studied coaches and loved coaches. And so I made that tough decision at that time to uh, put away my playing shoes and just say, hey, you know, let's try to train players and, and help coach players. And so um, been fortunate to be doing that ever since. But like, like Mitch said, too, is 
our identity sometimes gets wrapped up in what we do. You know, it, it becomes who we are, and we're always constantly trying to work at our game and better ourselves. And then all of a sudden when that ends, you know, a little bit of a part of us kind of ends. And so I did a – I did a lot of trial and error growing up. You know, there was a lot more things I could have done that were more beneficial to help me as a player. We just – we were doing everything. I mean, we were you – know, there was just so much wasted time, I think, working on things that now as, as now that we're older and we know, man, if I could go back in time and be more efficient as a player in my development, I would be – I mean, I would have probably been in the NBA. <laughs> I would have been a lot more better. <laughs> oh, so, you know – that's the kind of joy I have now is I can teach players not only to be efficient, but even more importantly is this is what we do. It's not who we are. You know, I'm a, I'm fortunate enough. I'm a son, I'm a grandson, I'm a brother, you know, I'm a son of God. You know, I have a great church life. And so that's who we are. The stuff that we do, even though it becomes a big time part of us, I think being able to help players with the mental side of, of their sport is what's so important and what I really find, you know, kind of more value in what I do now than anything else. But it's easier said than done. You know, it's so easy to tell an athlete. I mean, you got people that during this quarantine stage, I mean, they're, they're depressed, you know, and they can't be with their team. They can't work like they're, you know, normally working. And so, um, you know, just being able to kind of coach kids and help them through those things is, has been a real blessing. And, um, you know, Again, you know, Mitch had a far better playing career than I have in, in the sport that you guys love, but I think it all kind of translates. You know, we're all trying to get better individually, and we're trying to do it within the team setting. As far as what it does to help you in real life, oh, my gosh. I mean, individually, it helps you with your work ethic. It helps you with, you know, being relentless. It helps you with, you know, facing adversity. And then also in the team setting, I mean, you're going to have to be a coworker unless, you know, you're your own boss, and which is very rare. You know, you're going to still have to work with people, even if you're your own boss. And so, you know, having teamwork and being able to collectively, you know, help others and serve others, all those things, that is what it's about, is if you can use your sport, because there are going to be a lot of ups and downs, like you guys have all mentioned, if you can use your sport to help you in life, then guess what? You're, you're going to be on the right path. And so um, I, I just think an individual team in a sports setting, being coached, having to be managed and, you know, having to work with others, man, what a, what a better, you know, there's no better thing than, than team sports, individual sports to help you in life. Awesome. Sorry, Trevor. I told you I was going to go off script for a second. No, no, you're okay. Once you guys, I'm going to put you guys on the spot. I'm going to put them on the spot for a second. Mitch and John. Yeah, go ahead. Do you, do, can you recall a moment um, through your youth playing career, whether it was middle school, going to the, going to JV teams, to varsity teams, was there ever a time when you, when, when you faced some resistance or some adversity? And was there a moment, a coach, a voice in your ear, it could have been a parent, a friend, someone that just kind of pushed you through that moment? Mitch, you take that first. <laughs> <laughs> you had some time to think. <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, like, I had a lot – I've had a lot of them. Because um, <laughs> yeah. – you know, um, I wasn't a good student at all. Um, and, you know, I was being, you know, uh, like John, I was being recruited. I was luckily to be recruited by a lot of schools, um, but they got, I didn't get a pick. Uh, they got whittled out when they all saw my transcript. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the coach at Oakland, Eric Pope, he's always been in my corner, um, you know, and I can't pick out one thing because, throughout my journey, I've, I've had a lot of obstacles and I learned that, you know, people always think like, for me, it's not about, um, if an obstacle comes your way, it's not about going around it, you know, figuring out how to go around it or go over it. Um, I go through it. <laughs> um, and I am, you know, blessed, uh, beyond belief that, um, I have a support system that I do. Um, my brother, my older brother um, has never, ever wavered. He helped me uh, emotionally, financially, academically. Um, you know, he's been my best friend since, you know, um, you know, he's the one that got me into soccer, everything. Um, you know, our dad passed away when we were young and, and he had been a best friend, a father figure. So he's been like that. And then, um, you know, I married uh, an absolute uh, angel of a woman um, who's been with me 
through everything um, that under the sun that I put her through, um, moving around to all these different teams, um, being mentally not available, being emotionally not available, um, and she's always been in my corner. Um, and so I think for, for me, um, I can't pick one one time. It's, um, you know, like I said, just thinking about, because I, I like to, I, I said, you know, I'll do this, I'll do this. But then thinking back on my journey, it's um, how many people along the way have, have helped me get to where I am. And, um, you know, the people that I've kind of not only had in my corner family, all this stuff, but people, friends like you guys um, that I've met along the way, along the journey. Um, you know, and I'm sure now I'll talk to John, um, you know, somewhere down the line, you know, it's just a, a, a chain reaction, but, um, you know, that, that's the thing that I take, I truly take, uh, take back with me is, is just the relationships. It's, it's relationship business for me. Uh, championships are cool. Um, you know, everything like that, but growing as a person, um, and, uh, the relationships, you know, I, I, I did a, actually did an interview with the Cincinnati newspaper. They were kind of catching up with, with some old players and stuff. And he asked me to pick out one moment from um, the season or my career with Cincinnati that I would, you know, one moment. And I said, the stuff on the field's cool, right? But it's the, my wife and I going out to breakfast and people in the restaurant, um, you know, saying, you know, I had a good game um, Saturday or good luck on, on Saturday. You know, it's the people that, um, recognize my you know my wife's a volleyball coach and she was coaching at Xavier at the time and um you know people were wishing her good luck just out of nowhere and um the embrace and the relationship that you get from other people um that's and that's um what I would say right now and John mentioned the quarantine period you know not being by your friends but um it's the that's the reason that people are going nuts right now is because we are a relationship-based society and um, the Zoom calls and stuff are cool, and um, but you want to have that relationship. And um, the more good relationships you make along the way, um, the more prosperous you're going to be. Hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what he just said is is right on the head, and I think you can sum all that up with, you know, adversity. You can't pick out one there because there's so many. I mean, it's like kind of trying to pick out all the ups and downs of a season. There are so many that you can't pick out one. And it's the same way. Again, it goes back to life lessons. There's so many different adversities that you face all throughout your journey and that you will. It's not a question if it's, if it's going to happen, it's when. It's going to happen. And so when you go into that with a mindset, like it's going to be a lot of ups and downs and a lot of failures and a lot of injuries and a lot of setbacks. And I'm going to be stronger than those setbacks. I'm going to be able to overcome instead of, you know, well, I think I can avoid that. You're not going to avoid it. No one's going to avoid it. I mean, no one avoids the adversity of life and no one's going to be able to avoid it in a, in a team sport. And so um, I think the second thing that I took of that, just taking notes on when Mitch spoke is he talked about all his different support systems. No one does anything great alone. I mean, you're just not going to. And so through all those ups and downs, if you're just thinking you're going to be able to rely on yourself to go through that, it's not going to happen. And so again, that's where, you know, having that support system, the people that you can love and vent to, you know, whether it's your wife, whether it's your a coach, an old buddy. But, again, we are relationship-based. And so, um, you know, j just the stuff he said is the stuff I try to echo all the time. And, and there's a reason, you know, the adversity has created a change. There's a reason he's a you know, major, you know, soccer player is because he's went through all the adversities and, and been able to come out on top. But he, he talks about, and, and like I always talk about to my players is you make sure that you're taking care of the people that take care of you. You make sure you're always appreciating them and all that because, um, you know, not only family, but sometimes support systems are people that are not in the family. You know, they're people that are, that you would never even expect to help you and be able to get through tough times. And so um, it just goes back to relationships. Like, like Mitch said. <clears throat> awesome. You know, when I, uh, when I think about you guys, the biggest thing that comes for me and, and even Mo is like the ability to lead by example. And when I think when people think leadership, they automatically think what? Like, oh, who am I going to lead? I'm going to lead others. How am I going to lead someone else? How am I going to lead a team? But way before that, and going back to what you said of, of even being a son of God and, and the things you put on Twitter and the things that Mitch has mentioned, 
you have to be able to lead yourself. Mm. And that's eating healthy. That's being kind to others. That's leaning on others. That's staying humble. That's being able to get through adversity and bounce back. And like, that's one of the biggest things I took um, from what you guys just said, because what it boils down to is like, you're going to have to lead yourself and you're probably going to stumble at some point. But at the end of it, those stumbles, I think is what makes us coaches because now we can go back and say, Hey, I was you. I did that. I made that mistake. I didn't lead myself well, but you'll be all right if you take these steps. And I think that's part of the gift that we're given in those moments of adversity, because later on, it allows us to be able to lead others and be able to share that experience. And I think that's truly how you connect, which, which rounds us back to what we were talking about, with relationships. So I appreciate you guys sharing those, uh, those stories. I, I, heard, I heard not too long ago that every, every good story starts with facts, or every story starts with facts. So when you look at, you know, your journey, your story as an athlete, as a person, uh, whatever that may be, it's always going to start with the facts. So when Trevor, when you're, when you're talking about, obviously, the environment we're in now, it's what does your routine look like? What are the things that you're doing to help you improve in different areas as well? And so I think, you know, when, when John's talking, uh, we all can point back to probably many moments that made us who we are. But uh, adversity for me has always been fascinating of, like Mitch said, pushing through the wall versus around it or over it. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. I remember getting cut from my uh, eighth grade basketball team and uh, devastated by it, right? John, you like this one. I went and bought Michael Jordan's Come Fly With Me. And uh, all, all I did all summer was, you know, I saw my dad, you know, put a basketball hoop in our backyard. And that's all I did was just go out in the backyard, go in the backyard. Because in ninth grade, I was making the basketball team. You just remember moments like that. So not at your levels, but <laughs> just things that I remember. Well, I mean, it, it was funny, right? Because before we started this, we were all kind of talking and, and we mentioned the, some of the kids, I mean, that are watching this, we probably won't know who Michael Jordan is. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when John was talking, it made me um, kind of think of, if, if you guys, I'm sure you guys watched the two, the two episodes already of the documentary, but he was talking, you know, great, arguably the greatest, the basketball player to, uh, that ever played. Um, and, he said that he would have never accomplished anything without Scottie Pippen. You know, the guy that absolutely has everything, um, and he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have been anything without Scottie Pippen. So he holds that relationship dear, you know, dear to his heart. Um, and then you you bring it up, kind of what you did, and, and you know, it just kind of rang a bell. Me. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Trevor, uh, next. So Trevor. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things that consistently comes up um, in our circle, and you can figure out right away where people stand or players stand or parents stand or coaches and, and what's on their mind based on what they say, right? Because what comes out of your mouth and, and the actions that follow it, ultimately that, that tells a story. So I think when, you know, I talk to a kid and we do these, you know, the Jags have done such a good job with like player development but as far as the personal development side, where we're really trying to get to know the player and who they are and help to build them as a, as a person, which is another reason why I thought of you too and John, a lot of the things that you do. So um, if you briefly just want to touch on, you know, the importance of not just skill development, but making sure that you're consistently developing as a person um, within your playing style and what that means. Um, also the role of, of a parent, parent and a coach um, especially a parent now right because parenting is not easy um, especially having kids different levels some people have multiple kids that play at different levels um, some people you know their kids are chasing the dream and they might make decisions I'm sure Mitch saw how you said I'm sure there was some times when your mom was was checking in on you and <laughs> making sure you're okay regardless of you know you wanted to push through and get to that journey some of us want to go to colleges that you know our parents might have went to U of M and we want to go to we want to go to another school or MSU and you know, they might step in. And, um, so th yeah. these are important things. I think that you guys can, can lend some, you know, your thoughts on that and, and why it's important. So either one of you who wants to start, John, Mitch, doesn't matter. I'll let you go first. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, um, I'll address the parents, the parent issue first, just because uh, I just spoke on this recently in another uh, podcast and, I just, 
you know, I, I was kind of blunt. I got a few DMs on Twitter that, that uh, you know, were a little bit hateful. But at the same time, they were kind of thanking me for, you know, you're saying what we don't want to hear. And it kind of kind of gives brings a light. But um, I just don't think they know their role. You know, I, I think that, you know, you got players that play, you got coaches that coach, you got referees that referee, and you got people that are in the stands and they're there to be entertained and to support, you know, if you're, especially if you're there for a kid. So when it comes to parenting, you know, I think um, it's easy to kind of sit back as coaches and kind of say, Hey, that's not your role, but we have to have solutions. And so, you know, when I talk to different high school programs and, and different college programs, you know, around the country, it's, it's first off, man, you hear some of these parents in the stands and they're so passionate and they're always trying to coach and you're yelling and you're, and first thing is go give them an opportunity to coach. And so you may <laughs> call them or bring them in and say, Hey, look, you know, we're looking for some, for some actual help. If you want to come and actually help coach, and I know you're thinking I'm kind of being a smart butt here, but honestly, you know, good, passionate coaches are hard to come by. And so if you, if you got a parent who's constantly trying to, you know, coach and that's not their role, then bring them in and say, man, we'd love to get you a polo and have you sitting on the bench with us or on the field with us. <laughs> have you been able to coach? But here's the thing. You don't get to just coach your kid. You got to coach all these kids. And so sometimes just that little kind of kind of little nudge to them kind of changes their perspective on things and lets them, hey, man, that's not really my role. I got to ease up. Uh, if that doesn't work, though, maybe just showing them research on how it helps, you know, their IQ to be coached by, you're hearing kids have so many different things coming in and out. And you guys all know the more information you have, the less efficient you are. I mean, it's like, it's kind of like exercise these days. I mean, you, you try to go exercise and you're like, well, what, where do I start? I got 50 different plans I could do on this. I got a hundred different plans over here. And so sometimes all that overload of information actually hinders the kid. It's the same way when it comes to playing is they need to be listening to kind of one voice or our staff's voice, but this is kind of the way we coach and the way we do things. And so showing them research on how it hurts their IQ and it actually hurts their personal development, I think is another big thing. If you have a parent that's just like, well, we tried to get them to coach, they wouldn't do that, but they're still wanting to coach from the stands. So that's always another strategy that I, that I try to, to preach to college and, and, and more high school coaches in this sense and junior high coaches. But, um, you know, also just, the biggest thing is you have to have a strategy to educate parents. You can't just be like, Hey, that's not your role because again, they, they may take that as, Oh man, well, you don't know how to coach and I'm trying to help the kid. I'm doing this. So just being able to teach them that your role is I want you to coach, but I want you to coach and reward the effort, you know, not being specific in, Hey man, you got, you should have passed that to over here. You should have did this to over here. Hey, you should have kicked it over to him. He can score. That guy can't. And so whatever it is, your job as a parent is to coach and reward the effort, not the, not the game strategy. So I just think, again, having strategies for parents will help you so much. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of people just kind of hide behind the fact that, hey, that's not your role. I can't believe you're doing that. But um, as, as coaches, that no matter what the age group is, you know, being able to have those strategies will really help out with parents. And then Mitch, Mitch can go from there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that I don't have to address the parent issue because I don't want any uh, direct messages and stuff to me. Um, no, I, I, I totally agree. I think um, the with youth sports, I think there's so much uh, investment right now because everybody thinks that, um, okay, I'm going to pay. And, you know, s some sports are more expensive than others. Um, but so everybody thinks, okay, if I, you know, invest this amount of money now then I'm going to get it on the back end because I don't pay for college well that's not always the case right um you know I, I saw a statistic one time that said you know take you know one percent of all athletes play in college and then you know you're looking at and I don't know if my numbers are correct but um you know and then even a half a percent of that is is going to be a professional in any you know one sport I mean think about um, every kid on your team, right? Or every kid in your, in your soccer club, you know, we're talking about soccer. So every kid in your soccer club, maybe one kid that you know will be a professional soccer player. And that's at any level and maybe not even in the MLS, maybe just in lower divisions, um, maybe an indoor team, not even, you know. So the, 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 it's so minute um, to be a professional athlete. And um, when, it, when it comes to 
development of not only your skills, I think it's, you know, like Trevor said, um, the development as a person um, and, you know, John spoke to this earlier about um, developing your skill set to take you on in, in life. And um, I mean, I, I want to help. I want every kid to be a professional athlete. I really do. Because, you know, people said that I couldn't do it and, and, and I was going to show them wrong. So I hope everybody shows me wrong, but the chances that you do it are very, very minute. And if, if parents are putting so much pressure, I have, you have no idea how many friends that I had growing up that were on the youth national team that were, you know, this and that. Um, and then they went to college and they just stopped playing soccer. They haven't touched the soccer ball since because they got burnt out. They don't want to play it. They don't enjoy it. You know, one of my best friends grew up playing soccer his entire life. Hasn't touched a soccer ball since high school. He won't even watch soccer. He hates it um, because of the pressure, because of the parents, because of this, because of that. So I think keeping the enjoyment and using that to develop characteristics um, for later on in life, being a good person, um, you know, the developing the hard work ethic, um, getting through challenges. These are things that sports overcome. You know, I've been hearing a lot of talk because my wife's a, you know, a college volleyball coach. Um, still, she's at Appalachian State. And the, the things that I'm hearing from them, you know, because of budgetary issues, you know, sports are canceling, um, you know, programs are getting canceled. And yes, the money is, is, is one thing, but I think that what they'll be missing out on later on in life are the things that sports, um, you know, is, is being a, you know, a college, you know, soccer player going to pay you a billion dollars? No, but it's going to teach these kids how to get along in a team, how to work through things, how to do this, how to do that. It's the, the skills that people learn by playing sports. It's not the actual sport that's going to, you know, if I made a million dollars playing, I probably wouldn't be doing anything right now, but I'm, you know, <laughs> being a professional soccer player for most people isn't uh, lucrative. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's about the things that you learn, you learn along the way. And I know, uh, not too yeah, long I think, ago, uh, sorry, I, yeah, not too long ago, I was having, a, I had a question from a parent who asked me like, what was your experience? I got a chance to play overseas for a couple seasons, right. In a professional environment. What was that experience like? I said, well, I'll tell you the first thing that I learned was that when I got there, it's kind of like Dorothy and Wizard of Oz, which was, I wasn't in Kansas anymore. There was no mom or dad, you know, trying to work, work through a tryout for me, you know, with the coaching staff, you know, it mm -hmm. was, you know, you're going to stand on your own two feet. Uh, so that's one. Number two, you know, having the ability to have done a, a recent coaching, uh, coaching course with uh, USSF, I was able to go and I was talking to Mitch earlier, got a chance to visit Sporting KC and the setup, uh, especially the academy. And I know many of us that were on that course walked away very impressed because as you enter the facility, you can just see the responsibility that's put on the kids from all levels of accountability, from their roles, their tasks. You can see just within that, some of the leadership skills that they're gonna gain just from that environment. You walk in, your cell phone goes in a bucket, you walk through, the mom and dad are dropping you off at the door, and then you're, you're there, right? And so I was really impressed with that. So, you know, for me, the last thing I would say on that is that, you know, we're, we're preparing kids for it. You said earlier the statistic, I think the statistic I've heard recently was 300 million soccer players, 60,000 will become professional soccer players. It's a very, very low percentage. But yeah. many of the kids that go through sports go through some level of a tryout. And that's what you're preparing for. Because life, it's tryouts. It's trying to get into medical school. It's trying to get into this college. It's trying to get that position that you want to in your careers, whatever it is. So life, it's about tryouts and it's about being able to stand on your two feet getting through those moments. Yeah, right, and I and I would I would touch on one thing. You know, you said you're you know you saw our facility, you saw our academy. Um, you know, when when I first got the job, you know, I, I coached with our second team, which is you know the transition from um, our academy to to our MLS team. Um, you know, being in the center of the country, we put a lot of emphasis on development um, because we don't have the money to go out and and spend the millions and millions of dollars that LA has. Um, so we really want to bring our kids through our academy and, and someday, um, you know, be on our MLS team. So we take it very seriously, which is why we recruit from all over the country. Um, you know, we, we have kids from Michigan. We have kids 
kids from North Carolina. We have kids from um, all of, you know, whatever state doesn't have an MLS team because you can't do that. But um, we, the, the thing that impressed me when I first walked into the building is that every kid from our U12, so in our academy, we house the U12s, U13s, U15s, 17s, and 19s. Every kid knew who I was, not because I was a player, but because I was a coach. Um, you walk through where the players is, obviously it's a separate end of the building than where our offices are, but you walk through to get to the, the facility and kids come up, 12 year olds come up, shake your hand. Hey, how you doing? You know, no fear at all. Hey, how you doing? Look you straight in the eye. Um, and they know why they're there. They're there for a purpose. And um, they're taught from, like you said, from a very young age that this is how you, this is how you present yourself. This is how you go about your business. Um, you know, and I don't know if you guys want to use this trick, but I noticed that the very first time, because I, I watched the academy because I need to know who's coming up. Um, parents aren't allowed to watch train. Um, the gates, the gates are locked. You drop your kid off, you go home, you come and pick them up in three hours when you're, when their session's done. The, literally, you can't get into the fields. You can't watch them. Um, you watch them when they play games and that's about it. Um, but you know, every, every parent's going to have, you know, their, their opinion, but you know, they're not, they're not the coach and the kids understand that. I think more than some of the parents, um, because they, you know, we value development, but we also do very, very valuable winning. If you're not winning, if you're not performing, you're learning from a young age that you better work harder. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, um, I think one thing that, that both of you had said that, that stuck to me and me and Mo have talked about this in the past, which is the word support and, and being a supporter, right? Because you have a supporter and then you have a fan. And I think too often as coaches, as parents, as siblings, we become fans. And the difference between a fan is that a fan can be fair weather, right? A fan can be upset when you lose, a fan rides high, they fall low. Um, they criticize, they also compliment, but a supporter, they stick by you regardless of, of how things are going, right? And so I think we have to call on our parents um, and those family members to be supporters. And I think there's been a push of like a lot of negativity of like, go away, stay away, step back. But as a parent, what is your natural instinct? I think the natural instinct is to be right there by your child's side. So I think just like John said, it's not about go away, don't be a part of it, stay away, stay out of it. I mean, obviously there's those times like practices where it's a little more intimate where, you know, the kid needs to be there and have that one-on-one -on -one time with his coaches and his teammates where he can grow. But ultimately, I think in general, across all sports, across all schools, across whatever you might be out there, we need to teach parents the difference between being a fan and supporter and how they can be a positive part of the environment. Um, because I think not being a part of the environment is just as toxic as being a negative part of it. Ultimately, we want parents to be there um, because I think that is gonna empower kids and push them to the next level, but it's how. The second thing I would say when we talk about the cost, I think too often a parent might say, or someone might say, oh, you're paying $2,000 for this, or you're paying 1,000 for that, or you paid $200 for basketball shoes or ice skates or whatever it might be. But I think it's much bigger than that right? Because ultimately, who knows how long you're going to play soccer or basketball or tennis or hockey, but you have to go on being a person for the rest of your life. So every time I see a kid, I think, how can they be a good husband, a good wife, a good brother, a good sister, a good son, a good student, um, whatever it might be. It's like, no, no, you're not paying for soccer. Because if you're paying for soccer, if you're paying for basketball, honestly, you're wasting your money because you can do that for free. You know, you're learning about leadership. Um, you're learning about how to work with others. You're learning about how to take losses and wins. Man, I'm 30 years old and it's still hard for me to take a loss. <laughs> you know, like, so as a kid though, you learn those things and you process them. And if I had the coaches like how I see us today, I think it's our job to teach them that. And then the parents go home and then they have more time than we have to then reiterate those lessons again and then talk about it. And then by that time, hopefully the kid's ready to open up a little bit. And then they're that next layer to continue to be that supporter. So um, that's what I took from what you guys said. So I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, I, I would. I mean, I don't know if John has kids. I know that you guys do. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to 
be apparent. I don't know what it is, but I think that it's what I've seen is that parents, some parents are too early to come in and be the barrier between bad news and, and their child. Um, and I think we need to allow kids to have that bad news, have that, um, you know, if you get cut from um, a, a soccer team, you know, who's the, what's the first call you get? It's, it's apparent. Well, why is, why is Johnny not getting picked for the team? I'd have more respect from the kid to come up to me and say, hey, why did I not make the team? Oh, well, this is why. Oh, okay, I'll see you next year. You know, things, things like that, because once you get older, that your parents not going to be there to, you know, go to your boss and say, hey, you know, my son needs a raise or my son just got fired. Where are they? You know, wh what's going on? So. Right. Yeah. And, and, and piggybacking off that is just having parents that teach kids how to embrace adversity because it, it is easier for us but there are so many kids that are scared. They would never be able to come to a coach and say, coach, why did I get cut? But if you have a parent that can come and talk to you and say, Hey, what, what are the reasons he got cut so we can help him improve? So maybe he'll put in the work. Maybe he'll embrace this. Like you just said a second ago, you know, you and Michael Jordan have something in common. You guys got both cut from your basketball team at a young age. And so, you know, that adversity, being able to embrace that and then, Hey, go out and earn it is is invaluable you know hearing that from a coach uh, from a parent you know it just doesn't get better than that and so I think just having parents that teach kids that hey it's a growth mindset you're not very good now or hey you may have got cut now but they don't know what they've just created they created a monster you know you're gonna get you're gonna get back in there you're gonna work at it you're gonna go and earn it as opposed to trying to protect them it's like man teach your kids how to embrace adversity and go out and earn it and man, you'll be amazed at what happens. Because, but if you can and you enable them to make excuses and place blame, then what you do is you. A lot of parents like think, "Oh, I I made little Johnny stop crying. I've made him feel better." But in all actuality, all you've done is allow Johnny to every time things get hard and every time that adversity hits and you fail, that it deep in his subconscious mind he gets to blame others, create excuses. You know, uh, it's not my fault. It's somebody, you know, this guy likes this. And so, you know, all the different excuses we hear, but as opposed to, even though you may not make him feel better and maybe it takes him a little longer to stop crying, teaching them how to, Hey man, you got to own it. You know, this is what life's about. It's like our owning it and trying to make a plan to come back better because the world is vicious. It does not care about your feelings. It doesn't care if you're last place every day. And um, ultimately, as a parent, that's what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to prepare your child, you know, for the path. You're trying to basically work yourself out of a job. Good coaches are trying to equip players, just like good parents are trying to equip their son and daughter. And that's the only way you do that is by teaching them how to embrace failure and, and come back from adversity and, and own it. Love that, John. Preparing <laughs> your child for their path. I love that. And that webinar <laughs> with you on it. Uh, awesome. All right, guys, this is going to be a good section because we're going to go to our players. Uh, it, was, it was very cool to see uh, quite a few players who reached out uh, wanting to ask questions to you guys. And so uh, we may bounce back and forth just because of the time. Uh, but um, we'll start with Jawad. Jawad's actually a player on our 06 team in Dearborn. Uh, has been through a lot and he's doing phenomenally well and talk about a guy who's overcome a lot of a lot of different things over the last few years but Jawad's been great so I'm going to play the question from Jawad. Hi, if you're still a boy my age at this time during quarantine what would you do in order to stay in shape and keep in touch? Mitch do you want to take that one? Um, yeah uh, thanks for the question Jawad. Um, I think it's just about being creative, right? I mean, a lot of us have, um, don't have, you know, brothers or sisters or, you know, whatever, but, you know, if you want to work on your touch, juggle, do things against the wall, be creative. Um, you know, we have a lot of kids in our club, um, you know, our academy guys that are just, you know, going out and, um, you know, doing things that they never would have done before, you know, try to kick a ball in a basketball hoop or, you know, they're just, you know, trying to hit a tree from 20 yards away to work on their passing or, you know, just certain things like that. Um, but I've, I've actually done a couple of these 
Q and A's before, and everybody's like, well, what should I be doing this time? I think right now is a great time for a soccer player like you to learn the game, uh, watch as much soccer as possible, um, enjoy, uh, enjoy the game uh, rather than, okay, how much work am I going to put in your touch, your fitness, all that stuff. It's not going to go away to the point where you're not going to be able to get it back. Right. But if you take this time to, to watch games, to dissect games, to know what, Trevor or Mo or your coaches are talking about during training, if it hits, you know, five minutes earlier than it would have in a normal, then you've used this to really get something out of it. So that's what I've been telling people is just really educate yourself within the game. Awesome. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, Trevor, you want to introduce our next player? Yeah, this is uh, Lauren Griffin. She plays out of Nova and uh, she actually had a chance to be a leader with my girls because she guest played with my own nine girls um, in a tournament last year and she was awesome so um, I'm happy to have her here and, and to ask this question. Yep, here it is. Hi, thank you for putting this leadership discussion together. My question is, what would you recommend for young leaders who are looking to get into Thank you. John, you get that one. Well, again, um, thanks Lauren for sending that question in but um, I would be as hard-headed as possibly be when it comes to that <laughs> leadership. Again, I think leadership is summed up in, you know, putting yourself last and putting others first. And so if you, you know, love and serve, care for others, uh, I just don't see how anybody would ever try to minimize that. Um, and again, it's, it's kind of about your delivery as, as young players, you know, you have to have an imagination and you also have to kind of go through some experience, you know, issues. And so um, you'll learn kind of what works with teammates and what doesn't, but if, as long as you, you know, kind of put it where you love serve and care for others and put yourself last and you're, and you're thinking of the team before yourself. Um, and, and again, there's no better greater leadership tool, I think, than modeling. And so if you're putting in a lot of work as a player, and then you're asking players to come along on that journey and you're putting yourself last, man, that, that's a heck of a lot easier. Sometimes when you're, when your best player is, you know, not a very hard worker, it makes it tough for the full team dynamic. It makes it tough with coaches. It makes it tough with teammates. Um, but when your best player is also, you know, your best leader, your best leader is your best player that puts in a lot of work and kind of just sets the tone that, Hey, this is what, this is the reason I'm good. This is the reason that, you know, I'm at the top of the game and I'm the best on this team is because I put a lot of work in. And, you know, again, just because you, we've all had those teammates that are really good, but then they're also kind of – they're not fun to be around. And so um, leadership, I think, is, you know, being able to put yourself last but also having a great work ethic. I think they go hand in hand. Great attitude and great work ethic. And I think that's uh, – you know, you'll be well on your way. And if anybody's trying to reduce that, hey, too bad. You better jump on board because <laughs> – leadership is there's there's always a need always there will never not be a need in this world in this country and this doesn't matter if it's a job for leaders and so um that being said leadership has to be practiced it's not something you're just born with you know people always say it's a natural born leader i don't know if i agree with that i mean yeah there are some qualities that may make you a little bit better but i think leadership has to be practiced and the more you can do it at a young age don't worry about what other people are thinking just do it just be a leader but again it's all easier said than done. Being a leader is tough because again, we're kind of selfish by nature, especially a young girl like yourself, Lauren, you're, you're going to be selfish by nature. You don't have to tell a baby, you know, when you're a baby, it's like, Hey, everything's about the baby, right? You don't have to teach a kid. Hey, you know, it's about it. it they want it all and they're selfish. And so leadership must be practiced. And, um, you know, my kudos go to you because I want you to keep, uh, if somebody's trying to minimize or resist those, re resist those attempts on leadership, too bad. <clears throat> powerful, powerful stuff. Thanks, John. Uh, next question is from uh, Carson and Ashlyn Lutz out in the Huron Valley, Michigan Jags uh, area. Uh, play their question. Especially when your shots aren't going in, the calls aren't going away. Mitch, now, how many opportunities have you had for your shots to actually go in versus you stopping shots from going in? 
Not many. If I if I let that if I let that uh, deter my body language, I would have been a sorry sorry person. Um, yeah, no. I mean, for me, um, I you know just uh, there's always a, another time to um, to wrong or right, as I said, and, and a goalkeeper has a different perspective on, cause things can snowball, right? I mean, a forward can have the worst game of his life for 89 minutes, but then taps a ball in, in the 90th minute, you win the game. They're the hero. Um, a goalkeeper could have the best game of his entire life for 89 minutes, lets in a, a howler. Um, and then they're, you know, the worst worst player on the uh, you know in the history of soccer so um for me short-term memories um there's always going to be ups there's always going to be downs and it's just about going to the next action you make a mistake go on to the next you do something well you know somebody always said don't get too highs with the highs don't get too lows with the lows because it's going to be a, a lot of lows and there's going to be a lot of highs so um don't let it affect your mood or or your determination John, same question to you. And if you can think of a moment when you may have had a situation with one of your basketball teams where maybe you guys thought you were down and out and then rebounded to score a glorious victory or like a moment, if you could touch on what Mitch was elaborating on and yeah, you what, what a Mitch, story if you have one. <laughs> absolutely. What Mitch just said is, is I think summed up with just controlling your controllables. You have no idea you're a fool to think that you can control what's going to happen throughout the out the game. What you can control is the next play mentality, which is what Miss just said. It's the same thing we teach the players. I've got, you know, point guards I work with, and it's like the worst thing they can do is let one bad turnover turn into four. And the kids that do that, it's it's more of a mental issue. It's not their physical skill. It's more of they, again, they're too hard on themselves. They're trying to get in their mind, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you do that. And a lot of it goes back to their self-talk. And uh, Joshua Medcalf, who, if you guys don't know who he is, a great author, actually played soccer at Duke and played soccer at Vanderbilt, uh, is a buddy of mine. And he just constantly talks about, you know, being able to control your controllables and the way you talk to yourself after you make a mistake. Did a powerful exercise with me in a workshop years ago where how do you talk to yourself? Let's say you, do, you mess up at work or let's say you mess up at, you know, you, you, you're supposed to stop that goal and you, you give it up as a goalkeeper. How do you talk to yourself? And so people write things down. And then he says, now let me ask you something. Would you be friends with somebody that talks, talks to you the way that you talk to yourself? And of course, a lot of the people around that room, man, you're an idiot. I can't believe you did that. Oh my God, you're a fel I, mean, I can't believe you put the work in. And the way that we talk to ourselves and the way we see the world is, is so powerful. And so again, controlling your controllables and, you know, resilience and, and grit the ability to bounce back after mistakes, the ability to bounce back, you know, after your bad turnover or after, a, you know, you miss a, sh a shot, what are you going to do the next day? What are you going to do the next play after a mistake? Um, again, is, is going to determine, you know, your future. And so control your controllables. Um, as far as, a, 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 you know, there's a lot of different stories I could give you about, about teams. Um, but again, just having, I think, a team full of players with the mentality of next play, next play, next play. And if you have a coaching staff who's not preaching next play and they're, you know, they live and die with every play of the game, which we've all had some coaches like that, that makes it tough for a player. And so, again, it goes back to that culture of are you teaching your kids to have that next play mentality that we're not worried about mistakes. There's going to be a lot of them. I mean, if, if, if I don't care what it is, any sport in the world, a lot of things, there's going to be a lot of mistakes all throughout the game from you as a coach, from your assistants, from the, from the players, uh, everybody in that game is going to make a lot of mistakes. But I think the great champions of the world and the people that, you know, you, you read about in books and the Tom Brady's, the Michael George, the Tiger Woods is, they never lose their confidence. It doesn't matter how bad they fail. It doesn't matter if they miss that shot. I mean, Michael Jordan has that quote that, you know, I've, I've missed game shots over and over again in my life, but that's the reason I succeed. And that's just such a powerful quote because no matter how bad they fail throughout their game, throughout their career, they always come back for more. They never lose their confidence. Tiger Woods doesn't miss a shot and be like, oh, man, the day goes back. He just sets it up for the next great shot. And so the ability to – um, not lose that confidence. Again, 
you know, reading different literature and stuff. I think the way you talk to yourself, I think, um, you know, maybe highlights tapes of yourself, seeing yourself do good kind of helps your muscle memory. It helps your brain. I think that the way you see the world, like at the end of the day, if you have a diary or a journal, which I'm a big journaler, you know, and I don't do it big time. I got a thing called a five second journal, but I try to highlight the good parts of my day the great parts of my day and it can be something simple, but it didn't take a long time, you know, five second journal and you can just put some stuff. But again, you're teaching your brain to think about the positives as opposed to the negative things. And so as an athlete, being able to constantly, who cares about that? I'm getting ready to make the next great play, man. Again, it's invaluable. I hope that helps answer that. Oh, it <laughs> does. And it triggered a story in my mind. It's, it triggered the doc Rivers story. Uh, for those that don't know, doc Rivers, very famous NBA player now coaches the LA Clippers, but he had an assignment in class one day and he's in the, the teacher said, I need everybody to write down what you want to be when you grow up. And he put, he wanted to be a professional basketball player. So he goes to his teacher, hands it in. She says, no, I want you to put something more realistic. And so he goes back, he puts down, I want to be a professional basketball play, player. And the story is that he got sent home. Not sure if that part is true or not, not recommending kids go against their teacher's wishes. But it just shows you that mindset. And sure enough, he became a professional basketball player. And, you know, he's still, he's still in that life, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll go on that too, because at Pure Sweat, we're fortunate enough to work with Zach Levine, Chicago Bulls, you know, all star. And uh, I think he was in sixth grade. And they asked him to kind of write down what he wants to be when he grows up. And he said, I want to be an NBA basketball player. And uh, the, ma the, the teacher actually wrote on there, hey, try to be more realistic. Well, the dad goes up school and says hey that's my kid's dream don't don't do that and of course sure enough you know it took him one year of college and he's an NBA basketball player but again <laughs> powerful, you know, powerful. Just having that having that mindset and the vision if you have that vision from a young age I think Sabrina in the WNBA draft they showed a video of her in the WNBA draft a few nights ago from the University of Oregon and she was the number one pick and and she gets up in front of her class and they got the video and she said I'm going to be a you know WNBA basketball player and she's 12 years old and so you know, like what Mitch said, yeah, the percentages are low, but man, you never go against the kid's dream. Put that work ethic in and, and go after your dream. If you fall short, what's the worst that happens? You're a heck of a better person. You're, you can you can fight adversity more in life. You're, I mean, use the sport to refine you as a person and not let the sport use you up. You don't don't get your identity wrapped up in your sport. Just use it to refine you, and and you don't reach your you know, full dream, guess what? You'll be way better because of it. I mean, you, going through all the adversities that sports will teach you and all the different things, you're going to be far better person and be able to deal with life's, you know, ups and downs a heck of a lot easier. Absolutely. Awesome. Powerful stuff. All right, Trevor, next one is going to be from Cuber. Uh, so this is uh, Avery Cuber. I coach her in uh, Dearborn Jag. And she's super, super highly motivated. And this is a kid who sets goals and hits them and then asks for new ones. So um, I uh, thanks Avery for the question. My question for Mitch is, what steps did he take to get to the next level of soccer after college? Um, yeah, I think, uh, thanks Avery. And um, honestly, like the answer to that question, what I just heard about you from Trevor is, uh, the, the first step is don't stop doing what you're doing. Um, keep, keep shooting high, keep setting the bar high every, every time uh, you accomplish something. Um, keep going for something new, uh, and then that'll take you ultimately where you want to go. Um, you know, when it comes to my journey, it was just taking every opportunity uh, that came available to, to succeed. Um, and then if, if something didn't like, so my first tryout, I wasn't drafted, didn't know what I was going to do. Somebody offered me a, a trial. Um, so I went on it. Um, if I would have said, okay, I'm not drafted, then, uh, you know, my soccer career would have been over. You know, I, I would have went and done something else. Um, but a door opened and, and I walked through it. I uh, went to the first tryout and I got released. I got cut. If I would have said, oh, um, okay, I got cut. Now nah, let's let's try something else. Um, but I said, you know, where are we going next? And uh, you know, I went from Michigan to Charleston, Charleston to Minnesota. Ultimately, I got signed by Minnesota. But um, you know, if I would have just said, okay, you know, 
it's done, then I, I wouldn't have been where I am now. So um, for me, just keep doing what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we got next is Lucas. Okay. Lucas plays for Dearborn 05 and has played in Novi. So he's actually, and I've worked with Lucas personally, and uh, I'll share one story here after he asks this question. What do you recommend for a young athlete like me to do every day for soccer practice and conditioning to get better? Okay. So Lucas has uh, definitely, he's actually, John, I'm gonna pose this question to you. Um, and you can throw soccer slash basketball because Lucas is a really good basketball player, point guard for his team, as well as soccer. So he's bouncing with the idea of soccer, basketball, and incorporating those two, and then conditioning, obviously, in moments like this. So um, any bits and pieces of advice? Yeah, so, again, like, I love what Mitch said about uh, – I just took notes with when he was speaking earlier – about when you're a young kid, I think I think it's more about just being creative and having fun and having an imagination. Uh, whether it doesn't matter what the sport is, I mean, I can remember you know being out throwing a baseball off a, off my side of my house for hours at a time, you know, thinking I'm you know um, making a from shortstop to a first and, and throwing out St. Louis Cardinals or whatever. But um, as you get older, I think you need to have more of a detailed, specific plan. And and what Mitch said too was being able to you know, be a lifelong learner and basically be able to research, you know, what are, what are the best soccer players doing? You know, how are they eating? How are they resting? How are they sleeping? What are some of the tools and tips and tricks that they use? But um, I, I think at a young age, just being able to be creative. Um, I, I know from what I know from soccer, you're going to have to be in dang good shape. Those fields are long. Um, <laughs> have to have speed, agility, quickness. And so being able to research those things specifically, especially as you get older, uh, from a more sports specific soccer type setting, um, you know, trial and error, uh, you know, back in the day, we just, I can remember going into my high school library and, and reading slam magazines just to try to get articles and, mm -hmm. and find out what, what college or NBA players are doing. So maybe I could highlight something that I could try at home. And so anything I think, you know, if, if you love something and you want to be good at it, you're going to start trying to study it. Like, like Mitch said, you're going to watch film, uh, especially maybe as you get older, maybe not as a young kid, but you're going to start really diving into all the deep, you know, things that it takes to be really great at something, to be a scholarship player um, or be as good as you can be, whether that's, you know, scholarship or not. But um, I think at a young age, be creative, get out and play. And I think just being out and playing a lot's good training for young kids, you know. Um, but again, as you get older, you need to start to get a lot more specific and detailed with your plan. And it can't just be, you know, physical conditioning. It has to be everything. It's got to be, you know, how do college scholarship athletes, you know, how do they eat? How do they rest? You know, you know, how are you studied the game in every different way you can do it. Articles. The great thing is you got phones, you got YouTube and, and um, you know, believe it or not, I'm sure I could go on right now and, look on YouTube and say, hey, what are Major League Soccer's, you know, uh, some of the clubs, what's their nutrition plan like? And I can guarantee it, I can find some strength and conditioning coach in a soccer program or a coach that uh, goes into the nutrition of a different, um, you know, different club. And so there are so many ways by using technology to find out what the best of the best do and then just try to be able to mimic those things and make it, uh, you know, suited to your, to your own development plan. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, our last two questions. Yeah, so this comes from uh, Kareem Zeta. He's a, he's a great leader in our club, plays for our 06 boys, and he actually just went through an ACL injury, I believe, right, Mo? So uh, this kind of hit home when I read this, um, and it made me realize, and, and one thing with Kareem real quick is that as soon as he was injured, I know his coach had told me the very first thing he asked is, like, not me, not about him, but like, how can he help the team? How can he support the team? How can he? So I was, uh, it was really great to read this question from him. Go ahead. Hey, I played for the 06 Boys White. My question is, is what do you use in motivation to overcome an injury? Um, Mitch, you want to answer that? Yeah, um, you know, I've, I've had my, my share of injuries. Um, so I think, for for me, going into an injury, um, 
I used it as a way to come back stronger, um, a way to um, get over another hurdle. Um, you know, it, it it's kind of sounds silly, but um, it's just another thing that's thrown in your path that, that you kind of have to just work through to, to overcome. And uh, for me, I took it as a challenge. Okay, well, um, the soccer gods are, are going to test me again. So um, let's just get through it and, and come out the other side. So um, that's kind of my personal thing. And everybody has their own uh, way. But for, for Trevor to say that um, you had the mentality just to, to help the team, you, you know that you play a team sport and, and that you, you're a part of a club and that you have friends and that um, you know, are still playing and you want to support them. Um, that's the important thing. That's the thing to take out of that. Um, you know, just be there and, uh, you know, no injury, um, is gonna, you know, take away your friends, take away your teammates. So, um, for me, it's just about just getting through it and, um, come out the other side. Awesome. Thank you. And, uh, the last question here from Nate Curtis. Uh, this can go to, yeah, this is going to be Mitch and then John, feel free to chime in, um, as well. Um, yeah, so when I, when I made my debut, I was 20, 21. Um, you know, I went through college, um, and, uh, I guess I'm dating myself now, but when I played youth soccer, they didn't have uh, MLS Academy. So, um, and I grew up in Michigan, which we don't have an MLS team. So, uh, and there was no developmental Academy either. So, um, you know, I just, uh, just came through the ranks. And like I said earlier, any opportunity I was given, I, I just took, you know, I'm, I'm not saying um, any one path is, is the right path. Um, you know, I played for the Jags. Uh, a door was open to, to go to the Wolves. Um, and at that time, I, I took that opportunity. It was the best opportunity for me at the time. Um, and then, you know, went through college, um, which I used that time to, to get better. And um, then ultimately got signed and, and made my debut uh, when I was 21 um, after college. But for, for me, being in the MLS system now, um, being in a club that really puts emphasis on our academy, um, what I would say to you is, and I don't know if your coaches are going to be mad at me for saying this, but um, do the right thing that's the right choice for you. Um, when I say that is that if you don't want to play for an MLS academy, um, then don't. Um, if you want think that that pathway is, is the best thing for you and you it's like choosing a college too if you want to come to Kansas City and you think that sporting is the style of play that you want to play is the place that you you know you get along with the coaches all these different things then come to sporting um you know all these different things and I think but you coming to uh, MLS Academy isn't going to make or break your your chances of being a professional because if you're good enough, you'll find somebody will find you, somebody will see you. Um, college soccer. I mean, I'm right now during quarantine. Um, I'm watching college goalkeepers from last year, from two years ago, to know what's coming out of college. I'm I'm watching freshman goalkeepers right now to see what's coming out of goal, um, college in in four years, so that we know. Um, about the draft that we know going into our professional um, ranks, like what is out there. We have youth scouts that are at every single tournament to, um, to see. And, and like I said, it, for MLS academies, we have 12, 13 year olds that their families relocate to come to Kansas City. There's kids, there's 12 year olds that live with host families that are away from their families so that they can be in our academy. Um, but we also have um, a really, really good goalkeeper from North Carolina um that we tried to get um he's a 15 year old will not come to kansas city because he doesn't want to leave his family he doesn't want to leave his teammates right now so that's what's for him good for right now um so for me it's about following your own path and what you want rather than what you think 
other people are doing. Right, right. I believe there's an 05 that just went down there to to Sporting KC. I think he's down playing with uh, with the academy down there from Michigan. <laughs> Michigan here. Um, I had a question. So, John, I know earlier you'd mentioned that you had 15 Division One college scholarship offers. Was there one thing in particular that tilted your decision towards Arkansas State? Was it uh, the culture? Was it playing time? Was it the coach? Was it anything specific? Yeah, it was. Um, it was a lot of different things, but it was more of the coaching staff uh, being close to home, having you know a good a good program for my major. Um, but but I think more importantly than anything, you you know that you're going to spend a lot of time with the people. And so again, like what Mitch said, it's a people, you know, it's everything's about relationships and the people. So you want to have a great fit. I think I read an article a few days ago where now in, in college basketball, I'm not sure what it is with soccer, but um, you know, kind of a, a coach's, you know, tenure at a certain school is like 3.8 years. And so that's an average. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's scary because it's a different world now where these coaches are getting fired. You guys know how it is. And, and um that's sad because these kids are playing for sometimes three and four different coaches in their college setting. But um, those are the things that were important to me. I love what Mitch said too about, you know, everybody's not the same. Um, I didn't play a lot of AAU basketball, but I was a gym rat. I, I mean, I lived in the gym. I, I went to the gym in the morning before school. I did all the team stuff. I came back at night and I shot on the weekends. I just put a lot of extra time in and, and I love what Mitch said, too. I say it all the time, is if you're good enough, they'll find you. In this day and age, with social media, if you're good, people are going to talk about it. And if you're good, your, your stands are going to be packed and people are going to be coming and people talk and, and uh, you're going to be found. And so you'll have those opportunities, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to take them. You know, do what's best for you. And um, that may be you know, the way you travel by basketball or soccer, but it may be, man, I'm just going to work on my skills and get really dang good. And uh, the bottom line is you got to be able to put in the work regardless of which, which you choose because, you know, it's kind of like sometimes you may go in front of that big-time soccer coach, but if you hadn't put in the work, you've really – you're wanting exposure, but now you've exposed yourself. And so you want to be able to put in the work. And so when it's time for exposure, you're more than ready. And so um, I, I just love what Mitch said. I, I've taken, you know, three pages of notes here just on what you guys have <laughs> But uh, and both of you guys, I mean, um, all three of you got taking notes. But um, I, I just think, you know, again, everybody's got a different path and kind of having those good people around you, good coaches to tell you what you kind of need to work on more. Some kids are more they need to play a lot, but some kids need to really work on their skills a lot. So um, I just, again, love what Mitch said. Awesome. Trevor, <laughs> anything? <clears throat> Put you on the spot. <laughs> Uh, I'm just I'm just listening in and just like you said, taking notes and, and taking it all in, and hoping to to give that information. But I think the biggest thing that you've seen come up over and over and over and over and over again is kids asking, "What do they need to do to accomplish their goals?" And once again, like I said earlier, it starts with the ability to lead yourself. And I think we've been sold in society this idea that you need someone to, to make you great. And I'll take the words right from Mo when he says like a great coach can make you good, but only you can, can make yourself great. Right. And ultimately like, yeah, coaches can help you and they can teach you and they can show you things. Um, but I'm always, always, always starts with the individual. Um, and anyone that's out there selling it's this path or this Academy or this way, no, that's why you have great people coming from all over, from different wells, from different families, from different programs, from different coaches, because ultimately it's uh, the right environment, the right person, a lot of hard work, and uh, a little bit of luck, right? So I think there's no easy answer to that question, but it always starts with the individual. So that would be my advice, and, and that's kind of what we've been saying this whole time, right, is how important it is as you as a person to take accountability. and. Uh, set the pathway for yourself. And I'll tell you, um, just to kind of wrap up, but um, some of the things that I have taken in my notes, uh, preparing your child for their path, uh, wronging a right, um, identity, chain reaction, enjoyment, collective, relationship-based, uh, life is always a tryout, 
embrace adversity. And in, high, in parentheses, I have the why, right? When we talk about, you know, just having players, parents, coaches, those around you, just understanding the why. And I believe that helps us also embrace that adversity. Um, I think that's very vitally important. And um, imagination uh, and delivery when it comes to leadership styles, right? And we've seen all types of different leadership styles. I know, and I talk about this all the time with my players, but in our locker room, and our coaches, our locker room, you know, there's a lot of different styles and personalities and getting the most out of everybody collectively. And that's one of the reasons why cohesion is one of our core values, right? It's, uh, I think it's very important. So um, again, if anybody has any final thoughts, I just wanted to say first that I appreciate both of you guys coming on. John, awesome, powerful stuff. Mitch as well. Um, I think a lot of kids relate to you, Mitch, because you're from the Michigan, you're, you're, you're right from here. And then John, obviously, you know, your, your record speaks, speaks for itself. And I think this is going to get home, hit home with a lot of our, our kids, and we hope that we can bring you on sometime down the road, both of you, um, to do maybe some other things, and uh, um, I think it'll be great for everybody. Trevor? Yeah, that's it. Thank you, guys, and, and, you know, we appreciate you, and hopefully we can have you down here, like Mo said, and, and, you know, I think this is going to be great for parents, kids, coaches, um, and ultimately, we need to have these conversations more often, uh, in person, on video, whatever it might be, because these are the things that help us grow. But, I mean, I know a lot of people are going to learn from this, but I learn from this. And I think we learn from each other, right? So I think having these type of conversations is, is just important and it's empowering. And you know, I appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. Mitch, any parting words? Yeah, no, I, I really do. It means a lot to me that you guys would, would think about me to, to be a part of this. And obviously, um, anything that I can ever do um, to help uh, obviously I, I've had a lot of people help me throughout my journey and if there's something that I can do to help you guys or um, if there's a, a question that somebody wants to email to me you guys have all my information and um, anything that I can do when I'm home hopefully our first team uh, wins the MLS Cup when we when we get back to playing here soon um, so hopefully I won't be back in Michigan until uh, December or January uh, but um, anything that, that I can do, the one thing I will say to everybody that's going to watch this is um, just stay true to yourself, um, your goals, uh, how you act, your leadership. Um, sometimes the best leaders uh, say the least amount of words. So um, for me, it's just stay true to yourself, uh, be yourself, and don't lose yourself. So I wish everybody the best of luck and thank for having me. Thank you. John? It's, just, it's the same thing. Uh, appreciate you guys letting the basketball guy come on. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, Mitch said earlier, never turn down an opportunity. And, and that's what I always say. And so as soon as you guys out to me, I don't care. I, I was on a volleyball panel last week and uh, I've been on a lacrosse panel. I've been on a different podcasts around the country. And, and I just say yes immediately. And, and, and what it goes back to is just trying to help you know, I've, I've been helped by so many different people, as we all have in team sports, individual sports. We've, we, we can't do anything great alone. And so anything that somebody can pick up and, and maybe add some value. I'm a lifelong learner. I know you guys all are, too. And so uh, the more we can do that, it's going to ultimately help us serve and our, our kids a lot better. And so uh, I really appreciate you guys having a basketball guy on, man. I, I really do appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. You should play some virtual horse next time. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> we'll get something going. Um, I also just, in wrapping, I just wanted to thank also um, our um, executive director, Paul Tinian, for supporting this webinar, and then John Kapko, Alexis Watcott, uh, in our marketing department to help put the graphics together as well. They're phenomenal. So thanks again, guys. Stay safe to everybody out there. Stay healthy, and uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.